We're going to try and be very short and sharp. Um, now, look, I've already met some of you. You're from uh, relatively unknown universities like uh, Cambridge, Essex, Warwick, <laughs> Loughborough. Uh, oh, yeah, one or two in London. What are they called? Is anybody from IOE here, Institute of Education? You've been taken over by UCL. Anybody here from IOE? Yeah, Only on. two people. Oh, well, the rest of you can leave. This is about education. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're not going to uh, be of interest to many of you apart from um, those two. Now, look. We're, we're going to try and have a conversation. You guys have been sitting here for uh, two and a half hours listening to people talking. Very interesting stuff, actually. But uh, you haven't had much chance to ask questions. So we'll try and arrange for you to do that. Um, by the way, hands up. How many of you are students from Africa? Do, I mean, not via SOAS. From. <laughs> Not Africa SOAS, not Africa Essex, but Africa Africa. Hands up. OK. I want particularly to, this conversation is particularly about you, you guys and girls, but it's also about all of those who've brain drained themselves out of Africa. The brain drainers, as well as the brain stayers. So we, we want to go and get some of your discussion uh, in, in this session as well. Now, we, what we're going to try and do is look at what Carlos Lopez was saying about the economy. We're going at some point to ask questions about what is the structural transformation that we should be looking for in African universities? Do they need such a thing? Are they alive and well? Check out the rankings, if you believe in rankings. Some people don't believe in rankings. Um, but, you know, they have a way of telling us, you know, where we are. And students here... All of those brain drainers here probably checked out what is the ranking for LSE. I bet you did. Unfortunately, it's just ahead of Edinburgh University. <laughs> on, on the world rankings, Edinburgh is 24 and LSE is 23. Unless you look at European uh, rankings, and we are seven and they are six, unfortunately, so you, you can't win. So. <laughs> So what we're going to try and do is have a conversation about, on the one hand, global competitiveness, and on the other hand, Africanization and decolonization. Decolonizing the academy. You wouldn't believe it, my university in Edinburgh is running a conference today on that title, Decolonizing the Academy. And they're not talking about UCT. They're talking about Edinburgh, as well as Cambridge, as well as you know, UBC and Harvard. So this is not necessarily a UCT, University of Cape Town issue, decolonizing the academy. So that's what we're going to talk about. We've got five questions, and I'm hoping if uh, LSE is as good as they claim to be, <laughs> that somebody, will, somebody, thanks to Kirsten, will put a slide on the, on the, on the board here. Let's give them a few seconds to see if they can do that. <laughs> All right, off they, do, off they go. Okay. So we, we, we've asked our panel here, who I'm going to tell you who they are while we try and organize this. Who, who have we got here on the table? We've got Indri Asi Lumumba from Cornell but with very strong connections with Africa, including her own former university in Ivory Coast. We've got Bill Beatty. Is it Beatty or Batty? Beatty, but... Batty doesn't sound good, does it? Don't really mind. <laughs> <laughs> very good choice of uh, how to pronounce it. Bill, Bill Beatty is uh, editor of, uh, one of the editors of THE and has a particular expertise on, uh, in uh, global rankings. And then we move to Beatrice Muganda, which means she's actually from Kenya. Um, and she's, a, she's uh, been in my university, but she's currently running a, uh, a, a policy think tank on public governance and social, social science research, and doing a master's with 12 universities in, in that area. And finally, at the end, is my old friend, Dantu Tufera, who is in a quite well-ranked 
South African University, and is originally from uh, universities in other parts of the world, including in his own country, Ethiopia. And I uh, haven't said who I am. I was told by the speaker, don't forget to say who you are. Uh, I'm Kenneth King from the University of Edinburgh, and I've been put out to grass, which means you're an emeritus professor um, <laughs> of the University of Edinburgh. And I've studied history for a long time. Now, if we've got these uh, questions up here, we've got five of them. You just have to press. Yeah, yeah, I know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you think I don't know how to put the thing on? <laughs> Actually, these are very good people. Kirsten Short, uh, whose dad is in the room, if you want to check out her ancestry. <laughs> <laughs> She has uh, written a lot of the concept note, which has not, I think, been shared with you yet. Um, so here's the first one. Africa and the various world rankings. Do these and their criteria, ma do they matter for the internationalization of, okay? Public and private. Now what we're gonna do, we're not gonna have someone speaking uh, for five minutes. We're gonna have Dantu setting off on this and then we'll have a conversation about it. Uh, Dantu, do you want to be ready to go? Okay, I think I have to scream. Uh, good, still good morning by a few minutes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the organizers for inviting us to this event, and especially more so for Christina and her team, uh, trying to make sure that we are all here in the same room. Thank you. Uh, the first question. This uh, morning has been uh, a, a, a place and a time where we are actually debunking the epistemology of perception. And uh, with that, what do I mean? With regard to Africa and internationalization, Africa is the most in internationalized in terms of its higher education institutions. Yes, the most internationalized in Africa, in the world. The question is not by participation, but by omission. What do I mean by that? For example, the curriculum we teach, not only the sciences, but the social sciences, the research and the regime we communicate, it's through an international language. The materials we publish in international journals, the resources we generate, 75, 70, 70, 100% sometimes, generated internationally. Africa is the most internationalized by omission. Okay, I just want to start out by that. Well, thanks. Uh, I wonder if, uh, do, you, do you agree with that, Phil? I mean, it, Africa, that's a very good starting point. Africa is the most international by omission. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the question with regards to rankings, you know, I feel very strongly that although the rankings get criticised for being a, a system that propagates the sort of traditional northern elites and the, and the, the, the rich world universities, that they have a very, very uh, helpful role to play in helping uh, Africa realise its full potential. Um, you're looking at the, the, the 2063 agenda, it talks about Africa finding its position on the world stage. You look at the, uh, the Dhaka declaration from the first African Higher Education Summit in 2015. Pretty much every one of the principles uh, in terms of developing Africa's universities, globally competitive education, a world-class culture of research and innovation, adequate resources, linkages to society and the economy, internationalization initiatives, they're all drawn from data that we use to rank universities at the, on the global stage. We provide benchmarking information, we pr provide the trajectory for universities to develop and set their own future. Now it's interesting, um, this world of rankings is, is a very coincidental world. How come just before the student organized LSE summit, where most of the people sitting in the room are Africans, <coughs> mostly brain drainers, that the LS that the THE publishes 
the top 50 universities in Africa. I bet most of you will run outside, or you're probably already doing it on your smartphones, to find out who, who are these. Well, here's the answer. Five of them are in North Africa. I bet that surprises some of you. Three in, three in Egypt, two in Morocco, six in South Africa. There are only four left. <coughs> Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria. So there you are. It, it, I mean, uh, so it's quite interesting to react to that and think, you know, how was that fixed? How was that analyzed? Where's the data coming from? And what about all those other universities who operate in French? And what about all those universities that operate in Swahili? I am none. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you know, let's have a reaction from Beatrice. Yes, um, if there's any such a thing as being set up for failure, I guess some of the criteria that uh, Phil has just uh, read out talks to African universities in that manner. Let us talk about teaching excellence. You know that with globalization, we are shifting um, learning practices. Um, the northern universities have a virtual presence. We have all these problems with infrastructure, bandwidth, and access, and you know financing. So how then do you start comparing teaching excellence, for example, in an environment that has such scarce resources with teaching excellence in an environment that has everything, like where we are seated right now. Yeah, thank uh, you. You want to come back for a yeah. second, uh, Dan? Yeah, I, I think it is important, especially for Africa, to lend a lot of credence to this rankings, first to of all. To what credence to lay? Rankings. Yeah, to, to, to resist credence to. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, s several reasons. Number one. Half of Africa speaks French, and that half of Africa is completely uh, neglected, number one. Number two, in terms of data, I have been working on African higher education for the last 20 years. Probably I'm someone who has probably done a lot of work on African higher education consistently. Until very recently, we, even to this day, we don't exactly know how many universities we have in the continent, all right? Until very recently, we didn't even know how many students study in African institutions until a study I just finished, 15 million of them now. Okay. All right, so now these are a num num series of issues. We don't have the data, number one. We, we have the other issue which this rankings completely ignore is they are forcing individuals, faculties, and academics to actually publish and look at issues which are less relevant to the reality than what is happening elsewhere. Okay, let, me hold, let me hold it there, Dan. Uh, less relevant because they, you know, he's absolutely right. The citations indexes which are drawn upon by these rankings are of the kind that are, that are, that are accumulated in Elsevier, the, scientists, uh, the, the Scopus uh, Citations Index. Um, but it's very hard to get alternatives, and it's particularly hard when you, we come to a third question on indigenous or uh, localized methodologies, localized knowledge systems, and so on. It's much, much harder to, to get the data on that. Let's move to Andri for a moment, because you can also find on the web that the world rankings are available for 2015, 2016, and most unfortunately, Cornell is ahead of anybody. I won't say by how much, but it's, it's, it's rather embarrassing. Uh, so, Henry, uh, don't talk about rankings if you don't mind, uh, but what do you want to say about this internationalization? Well, um, as they say, all protocols observed, because I cannot thank all yeah, don't thank of them. you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, still, it's very important. Um, yes, well, um, it may, the way uh, Kenneth has put it as if I am at Cornell. I'm still very much from Africa. Okay. I'm involved. The brain drain, the way it was conceptualized before, brain drain, it gone for good. But that's not what it is now. We're going back to the best idea of a brain circulation, exactly. if it is brain. Uh, so the issues that are being raised are not only issues in Africa, the issues of colonization, decolonization, 
are the same that we're raising in, at, at Cornell. At Cornell, I'm based in the Africana Studies and Research Center. Africana, not African, because African studies focuses on the continent. Black studies, African American studies, diaspora studies, focus only on Africa, the historical Africa outside of the continent. But Africana studies philosophically precisely raise this global issue of colonization control uh, that needs to be addressed in a systematic way. Well, colonization and decolonization. Well, decolonization, when we going, if we're going to address it appropriately, we're going to address we need, it yeah. Number three. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to address not only decolonization from the African's own perspective, experience, goals, but from also the colonizers. We need to decolonize exactly. from both parts. So that, it's just a brief uh, introduction. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Indri's point about brain circulation is a really key, I mean, to change, for students, to change the language you're using to describe Africa is very important. And to, to realize that the history of what we're now talking about is not two years ago in South Africa. The history of the concerns about Africanizing the curriculum, <coughs> adapting education in Africa to African needs, goes back to two people who you should also look at on your smartphones. Edward Blyden, uh, president of Li the Liberia College in West Africa in the, in the 19th century, and Africanus Horton, 1850s, medical graduate, the first African uh, alum alumnus of my own university. And they, they, they had completely different attitudes towards Africanization. One saying, let's keep clear of the European philosophy, because the European philosophy allowed, uh, allowed Europe to enslave Africa. And the other, the other is saying, let's catch up, and let <coughs> it, let's catch up and get science and technology and, and, and you know, be on the same part. So this is a very old conversation. Now, we're going to move on to this one. Um, African research and, and consultancy. These are quite big issues, and I'm, I'm going to ask Beatrice to kick off in, in, in the first minute or, or two on this because she's very much a person who is concerned about the status of African research and consultancy. Beatrice, you say? Yes, um, Africa is missing or almost missing from global research. If the statistics we have are anything to go by, we have 140 <coughs> researchers per million. When Europe has 3,000, America has up to 4,000 researchers per million. This is not good because what comes out of research should ooze and seep into our lives, our social lives, our political lives, and you know, spur socioeconomic development. So when we are missing, what does this mean? I'll give an example, a simple example, dance. And I wish I had talked to you earlier because we could have some music. <laughs> yeah. So you would watch a ballerina dancing, and then you'd watch, you know, that music from West Africa and East Africa. And you look at the two, and you want to compare, mm -hmm. and say, look, the African is not dancing well because they're not doing those ballerina moves. Yeah. <laughs> is that fair? Mm -hmm. Africans must stand up. They must not shy off from proclaiming what they know. Unfortunately, it is dismissed based on Western conceptualization. And when we try to publish in our own journals, they are dismissed as junk. Fortunately, I have one of the professors who runs what is called a junk in the international eyes journal. So probably he could tell us what he thinks about this. Okay, well. What we're trying to do here is also, is it? Yeah, is also um, put on the table the reality of what goes on in resource-poor universities of the kind that um, our colleagues on the, on, the, on the panel know very well. Resource-poor universities, enormous classes, very poor libraries, very few so-called international journals, and yet the pressure to publish on those is, is 
reinforced by the promotion systems of many of these universities. If you want to become a prof in Ibadan or my old university, Nairobi, you have got, at the moment, to publish in the north. Could I? Um, yeah, uh, Phil. I think that the, the most important thing here, I think, is that the dangers of African universities not embracing global data definitions, global benchmarks, global performance indicators are really strong. I think that's what's going to hold Africa back. There's a, a piece in The Guardian last week, Philip Clay, professor at MIT. The isolation of African universities from the world rankings means, he said, African academics are isolated from the global knowledge generation, which increasingly comes from collaborations across ranked institutions and across national borders. Max Price from uh, Cape, Cape Town University, the production of new knowledge should not be the preserve of the rich and powerful countries of the world. The question of north-south inequality is not just an ideological matter nor an issue of national pride. It's about economic development as developing countries transform into high technology economies. It's a global knowledge network. Tapping in, sharing, collaborating across borders is absolutely essential. And Africa's leading universities, I think there's a, an issue about diversification. You need a diverse system. You need world-class, outwardly facing global universities in Africa, creating new knowledge in Africa, retaining talent, attracting talent into Africa as well as a different type of institution that will be addressing more local concerns. But more and more, the top research challenges are global concerns. Exactly. So, the, so what, when we turn in the next question to the Africanizing, uh, to the Africanizing uh, dimension, we, we must recall that can it be, can, it, can that go hand in hand with high quality um, production? And the answer is, Yes, you don't have to be doing ballerina studies. You, you, can, you can, and you don't mean, need to be doing indigenous knowledge systems only to compete on the, the kind of top level um, production of knowledge in African universities. Um, uh, Enri, do you want to come in? Yes. Um, <coughs> the colonization, well, I just... Uh, oh, Oh, this third one. Oh, uh, so you, you okay? This. Yeah. This is on research and consultancy. Yeah, I have it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Let's take down to first. Yeah. No. Out. Okay. I, I, I think it is always important to look at what happens in reality, regardless of what is coded here by MIT or somebody else. If one had to compare partnership of African universities with the North or the, the, West, the West, however you define it, 99% of it happens already. African institutions do not talk to themselves. They do not do it because of the resources. Because of the numbers I mentioned earlier, the kind of partnership that exists, the research we do, the issues we focus on, is dependent on the policies that are already shaped elsewhere. So we already have massive partnership with the West, North institutions. So I think there is that notion of ha having to do even more is somewhat uh, unpalatable to me. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Okay, no, the, the yeah. The point I want to make is, um, is the African model of university or research what Africa needs? If it is decided, and by whom, that this is Africa needs, and if it models after the European, then we have to do exactly the type when they're talking about excellence. But if it is not the type that we need, then we need to find other criteria that are as valuable as the ones that the others have developed for themselves. Yeah. Because their systems evolved organically from their own experience for their own uh, history. And then we come and we want to be part of it. Not that actually we want to be part of it. I, I just uh, had an, briefly an article that came in the Institute of Research, uh, an, uh, International Institute of um, Research uh, Education, uh, uh, in which I argue that where things went wrong is during the colonial era, when the Africans, 
in search of the, of the idea of freedom and equality, said what is good for Europe must be good for us. Therefore, let us transfer the European education system to Africa. This is when things went wrong. But, but let, 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 let me, as a historian of the colonial period, <laughs> um, where I did my PhD, um, let, let me remind you that one of the, the first phase of decolonizing the curriculum was an attempt by particularly Britain to make the curriculum of African schools and colleges and a handful of universities to make it adapted to Africa. Adapted to Africa, i.e., they said, why, why don't you follow what Booker T. Washington is doing in the southern states? Focus on agriculture and stay where you are. And the people who opposed that in the, in, in the interwar period in Africa were people who, you ought to know if you don't, W.E.B. Du Bois, who said that if Africa allows its curriculum to be differentiated before it wins political independence, that spells the permanent inferiority of, of Africa. So people like Du Bois were very aware, long before Bantu education was identified in South Africa, were aware that it was extremely dangerous. And he said, we'll have to do Greek and Latin, because if Greek and Latin is what they do in the West, we'll do it until we're in charge of our own destiny. So it, it's a very big issue, this issue of de decolonizing was started earlier on in the colonial period and was resisted by Africa. Uh, not of course, but it was resisted of course in, uh, particularly in South Africa when Bantu education. So we're going to look at this, this big issue which um, <coughs> if we could live stream what's being said in Edinburgh at the moment, it would be quite intriguing and perhaps uh, we can do that later. It is actually online, what's happening in Edinburgh, on decolonizing the university. So, Indri, without seeing what we're saying in Edinburgh, do you yeah. want to address yeah. this thing? But before, I would like to address what you said in uh, talking about uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and um, Booker T. Washington. Okay. It's not that um, agriculture was being advised, it's who was making the decision. If the colonizers said, Africa, this is what is good for you, then it's a problem. It doesn't matter whether it focus on uh, uh, agriculture or copying them. It's the Africans who must decide. Uh, if you compare Africa to Japan, for example, where when the, the emperor decided that education is an is a, is a, uh, obligation, Japanese were sent all over the Western world. But when they were applying what they learned, it was on the solid foundation exactly. of their own culture. Exactly. So it's who is deciding what to learn. Even the brain drain is what, how you adapt what you have learned to the African context. So this is one thing. And briefly, Greek and Latin. If the Africans decide to learn Greek and Latin, what is the usefulness? Is it because of the fact that Greek did not evolve out, out of a vacuum, that they learned from Africa, Black Athena, by another famous historian. Um, uh, uh, yes. I so, didn't so Latin, by the way. yes. So if if <laughs> yes, if so, if you think that everything started with Greece, you have a problem. Okay. But as an African, She's right. yes. So it's not whether or not we learn Greek and Latin, but how do we position it vis-a-vis -vis what Africa produced long, long before, long before Greeks started. We actually started. have a graduate of uh, the University of Athens on the panel. I'm here. Did you do modern Greek? No, yes, I did. Yeah. You did? Interview. Uh, Huh? And to view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, now look, for, for those who just before Andrew comes back very briefly, this discussion about decolonizing the curriculum is not just about taking Rhodes' statue down in the University of Cape Town. It's not about fees must fall 
it's not just about a handful of you know, the top universities in South Africa, as, as I'm sure um, Dan Tu will, will confirm. It's not about, although it's quite a big issue, removing Afrikaans as the uh, language that helped to create apartheid from Stellenbosch, from Pretoria, etc. It's about a much bigger issue, according to those who are promoting it, the importance of Africanizing and decolonizing the academy. Do you want to say a word more uh, on that? Yes, and, and before that, uh, for you and all of us, uh, because uh, learning is not only for students, we are all students, lifelong learners, as it was mentioned this morning. We need to first uh, be clear about concept. I saw in some of the document massification. This is a term that has gone around in the past 20 years. And if, if massification were true, then we would have by now literally all the Africans of the university age in some kind of institutional learning context, which is not the case. What we have is overcrowding. When an auditorium like this that was built for 800, 1,000 people, and then we have 3,000, 4,000, that's overcrowding. That's not massification. Yeah. Massification is when a large number of whatever age learners go into the learning system. This is not happening. We have 7, 8% uh, increase, but that has not amounted to much when you compare the statistic of Africa to the rest of the world in terms of the learning uh, age population that is still outside of the system. So the point I'm making by using this concept here is that we need to reconceptualize, to be clear in terms of what we're talking about. All this international comparison, what are we comparing? What are the indicators? What are the criteria? And who set up those criteria to measure what? From whose perspectives? So these are all critical points that we need. If we don't have clarity about the concept, then we will not be able to actualize it. Just Briefly, second, uh, yes. Just a second, madam. Um, the, um, there is a question about whether this, um, this storyline is only about the social sciences and humanities? Is it only about Africa? The, the, one of the r r people you ought to read on this topic, who's written two or three books on world-class universities, Jamil Salmi from North Africa and the World Bank, um, he, has, he has argued that this is not on the agenda of East Asia, this topic. Decolon it's not on the agenda of Indonesia. It's not on the agenda of Malaysia. It's not on the agenda of China. China tried a bit of radical decolonization called the Cultural Revolution, and they don't want to go down there again. But I don't know, Phil, whether you want to react to, you know, how widespread is this, um, is this discourse? I, I think the, the, the crucial thing for me is that ultimately rankings, if you break them down, the global rankings, they're about giving you the information. They're about data. You can break them up, you can break it down. We have 13 separate performance indicators. They're about forging your own identity. Um, in, in 2013... Forging, did yeah. you say? Yes. It's a tricky word, because forging your identity could mean faking your identity. Well, look, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a great story here, right? The, the KwaZulu-Natal University, where Damtu is from, their president, uh, their former president, uh, Malagapu Magopa, that institution came out of apartheid. It came from a merger of the University of Natal, a colonial university, and merging with uh, De uh, sorry, Durban, Westville, and uh, Natal. It was a huge uh, change in 2004. He used the university rankings, the global university rankings, to build that institution. He wrote me an article in December 2013. Post-merger, it was essential to identify an academic project that scholars and students from two very different institutions can buy into. It's about giving them benchmarking, it's about giving them data, it's about teaching excellence, research excellence, internationalization, community engagement. There's data, they create a profile of the institution, they can compare themselves to whoever they want within the profiles. It's about building and creating your own vision, it's about giving yourself, the, empowering yourself to become who you want to be. And, and in my own area of education, I, I have to say that you know, schools of education in this country do pay attention to 
not the THE ranking, because you, the QS ranking, you can find out what are the top schools of education uh, in, in this country. And, you know, Nottingham University and the IOE, Institute of Education, pay a lot of attention to that because it has impact on who are the students who come from abroad, you guys, um, to your university. You won't believe it, we've got about 1,600 Chinese in the University of Edinburgh. Not unconnected, I've, I think, with what, wh where we stand in these, uh, in these uh, indices. Whatever their weaknesses. Uh, Phil, uh, 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 A couple of things. Number one, what are the implications for ranking for African in, uh, institutions? I'm not talking about THE here, because there are five of them now, THE, AWRU, a a QS, Web, Web, Web or metrics, et cetera. What are the implications for African institutions? Indri already spoke about the massification. Institutions, instead of addre addressing the issues of teaching, the issues of learning within this massification, or massifying system. They are now thinking about how to tinker the, uh, the, 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 rank, the ranking methodologies so that they actually appear on that. How, how does that work? What are the implications? What are the resources that are going there? This, I will leave that to your imagination. Yeah. Number one. Number two, this, in fact, what is also for some of us who are based <coughs> in Africa, which we find it somehow arrogant and audacious, and if it's not, if it's not condescending, oh, it happens here too, huh? Yeah. Hey. Hey. So I get, I get my minutes back. You know what we we feel that condescending on the part of these rankers is they, they declare that they are building Africa's legacy. And one declares that, our, uh, in fact, it goes on to say that uh, it's eliminated for you. The mission of this particular entity, it appears on the website, is to build world-class universities for Africa. Can you imagine how a ranking entity, which comes into your space and says, okay, you are number one, you are number 10, with particularly very weak data to say that it actually contributes to your development. It actually goes back to the story, sorry I didn't pick your name, the earlier uh, the, the cow story, you steal the cow story. You, they get the data which is very weak, non-existent, and they say one is better than the other, and they tell you also the legacy. In fact, the other one just okay, say, okay. Uh, let me one, one, please, uh, Mr. One Chair, second. and the other one, said we are also building a shared global legacy. How would a ranking institution walks into an African entity and declares that they are actually building Africa's legacy? Number, number the last point, the last point is that they do not partner with any of the African-based regional entities, AAU, the Association of African okay. Universities, IUCEA, CAMES, okay. AWRU. Okay. I'm not speaking in this case with regard to HE. I'm talking about the rest, all of them. I just want to make this point. Thank oh. you, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Yes. No. <laughs> Fellow students, you can see that we've picked, although it's not as sexy a topic as illicit <laughs> flows, <laughs> I don't like the term illicit flows. It's a rather curious term. But the, um, although it's not as sexy a topic as illicit flows, rankings and decolonizing are quite controversial. And you can see, uh, in, even in the panel here, that we, we're not all of the same mind. So um, we, for that reason, I'm going to ask you, Oh, the brain drain is here. Uh, how, hands up, be honest now. How many of you checked out the ranking of Loughborough, Essex, Cambridge, uh, Manchester before you set off? Hands up. How many, of you, how many of you checked the rankings? If I were you, I would do the same, even if you know it's got weaknesses, as Dan Tu says. But it's, 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 it's one way of checking out 
where the, where the, you know, what, where does it, where does Loughborough stand in the UK? Well, let's move along to this next one uh, because we're going to give uh, 20 minutes to at least to you people to put your your issues on the table. So prepare your questions, not speeches. Okay, <laughs> questions. <laughs> All right. So here's the next one, and Beatrice is going to lead on this and just tell us how really important do you want to transform structurally, and if that ha needs to happen because she said so earlier. What do you need to do in planning and strategy terms? Just get some money from the World Bank? Or what else do you have to do? Beatrice, you're... Firstly, you need a research agenda. And this research agenda should be closely related to the national research agenda. Research shows that universities have research agendas that are not consistent with what governments or their nations want. So they are not building knowledge that is going to help problems in that country. For researchers, for us policy practitioners, what is the research for? It is not about building disciplinary knowledge for which we have been dismissed by the Eurocentrism. Mm -hmm. Let us now turn to solving our problems. Let us focus on research that is policy relevant. And I do not agree that research that is policy relevant is not rigorous enough. It all goes with your methodology and you know the, the convictions that you have about how you frame your research questions and your ideologies. Yeah. About funding, again, when this research is consistent with the national priorities, it is easier to access money from the National Councils of Science and Technology. When you're going to solve a particular problem for your country, it is easier to attract money from the pa bilateral partnerships with all these international organizations. So the problems that we have, again, is about mentorship. There, some of the research that has been quoted below, uh, before showed that um, in uh, eight of the best African universities, only about 25% of the um, academic staff are <laughs> professors and associate professors. So doing good research is about being guided. If we do not have the capacity, how are we going to do that? And it's about training. A lot of the conversation about research centers on funding. You can have the funds, but if we don't have people who are adequately trained to do that research, then it becomes a problem. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. The, it, it is essential to look at the issue of donor resources, partly because Africa has so often been a recipient of donor resources that were anti-university. I mean, for during the great period of structural adjustment that your professor here, um, Kandawiri, has so uh, masterly, masterfully analyzed, you know, many bilateral agencies, including the multilateralists, had decided that support to African universities was not that important. And so it became extremely difficult to, to get external support for, for university development. And so the issue about where are the resources coming from, whether it's to Beatrice's program, whether it is to other programs, people are looking very carefully at that and looking at the World Bank's current centers of excellence uh, uh, money. That, that's big money. And so it's quite difficult for universities to say, oh, I won't get into that competition. Um, we're going to move on, uh, but Rav Damtu, do you have anything to say about concrete plans and strategies to, um, to, to change the epistemic, yeah. the knowledge inequalities? Thank you. I was part of a, a team uh, who was uh, actually called up on by the African Union Commission to develop its 10-year uh, education strategy. There is already an explicitly stated yeah. document exactly. with regard to what, as Africans, ought to be doing in line with Agenda 2063. I'm not going to narrate the elements, but there are already eight elements included or embedded in there, one of which speaks around funding. Yeah. For example, South Africa, which is supposed to be probably Nigeria would be now laughing, uh, is now taken over by Nigeria in terms of economic power, superpower. It only managed to actually dedicate 0.76% of its GDP for research. Yet the UN mandates that we, they commit 1%. Yeah. 
Even South Africa has not managed to do that. So money has already been an issue. And I, there are eight elements. I'm not going to narrate all those points, but I thought I would just. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very important issue because there's a tendency, including in the student body here, to access these easily accessible sources of data. And, you know, DFID, World Bank, uh, EU, et cetera. But, you know, to look at the, um, the agenda of the African Union and the Association of African Universities and what came out of the Africa Summit in Dakar last March, these are important if you're really doing, going seriously to study the, the situation in African universities. Here's our last issue here. We go back to what we touched on during the, this discussion, then we come to ask you for your questions. If there is a debate between what I'm calling world classers, short in form WCs, <laughs> WCs, if there's a debate between world classers and DCs, district commissioners or decolonizers, do, do they have two quite different sets of quality criteria? I mean, if you're really going to push the boat out on decolonizing African universities, are you into a different set of impact criteria than Phil and his um, colleagues are promoting through the ranking system? So that, this is our last question. Uh, Phil, do you, want to, do you want to lead on this? I think the, the key thing for me is that they're not mutually exclusive things. You know, the, the, the rankings are, we look at uh, 50 million citations to 11 million research papers and 23,000 journals. We normalize for every single discipline. They're not about saying that one type of research project is more valuable than another. It's about which ones are actually disseminated most widely, which ones contribute to new knowledge, absolutely irrespective of whether that's in STEM or whether that's in arts and humanities or whether that's in uh, climate change. Any, you know, it, it, we don't prejudice any judgments around uh, what is being studied. It's about excellence in the university's own terms and what they consider to be its own mission and priority. So they're not mutually exclusive in any way. We're just giving data to help people understand the situation the world is in, in terms of inequality of power, in terms of the contribution of new knowledge, in terms of retention of talent, the development of talent. I, I think there's, there's no sense that we're propagating a certain type of excellence. There's, there's more than one type of excellence. And actually, the rankings are able to be broken down and used and abused in whichever way people see fit. Um, it's an interesting issue, uh, kind of paradox in a way, that the very uh, universities, which are the top universities in South Africa, ones that are well known to some of you, uh, are, are the very ones where the student body is most discussing the decolonizing agenda. So it's Stellenbosch, Rhodes, Pretoria, uh, Witts. Uh, I don't know about your university, um, uh, Damtu, but I think it, it is. So it's possible to have these two things going on at the same time, a, a debate about world-class status and rankings and a debate about whether South Africa universities have sufficiently done the Africanization of their curriculum in the way that we did back in the 1960s in the University of Nairobi. Beatrice. Yes, um, I have done a lot of work on quality, and um, I, I really get disturbed when the whole thing about quality boils down to ranking. Yeah. Ranking is just a small part of it. If we look at UNESCO's description of quality, it is very comprehensive. We are looking at, at fitness for purpose. I don't care if today you are going to invent the latest aeroplane and we cannot domesticate it in Africa. It is not going to help us. Let us get some simple technologies that work to improve the farm inputs. Then there is the issue of benchmarks. You set your own benchmarks according to your circumstances. Maybe we cannot have 30 students in a class, but we are going to have 60. Are you therefore going to maintain the 60? You, you set your benchmarks and you measure them according to your conditions. Then you have the stakeholders, the direct ones and the indirect, including <coughs> government, business, agriculture, are you meeting the needs of your stakeholders? Let us look at these things more broadly and then really get the proper judgment. Are we doing something reasonable or it's just about ranking and everything else we're doing is nothing? Thank you. Thank you. One sentence. <laughs> Can you do it? Uh, one sentence. Or two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, in, in the Western uh, research system, going back to the Latin, there is an expression that says, ceteris paribus. It means other things being equal. Yeah. And it is not applied here. <laughs> so that's a really wrong research, wrong model. When you're comparing, just comparing. Yeah. You need to apply that. Okay. Basic. Two. two. Yeah, two. Uh, <laughs> that's my second sentence is. <laughs> <laughs> the second sentence is what was said this morning. Colonization, the colonial framework, colonial system is alive and well. And it's not only in the financial flow, it is in the academic world. Who are the agents who are deciding this criteria? Africa needs to have its own system of excellence and it has not to be checked and agreed upon and blessed by others. We should have those standards well, it doesn't mean that we don't participate in others. Well, I will stop here. <laughs> I, I'm going to let, uh, now, Dampter is very well educated, so he knows also how many sentences are in one sentence. <laughs> I could use that time. Uh, just, just by way of a conversation. In fact, it goes very well with what Indri said. It's not as if nothing happens in Africa, please. OK? Like, for example, in South Africa, we, what we have I don't know if many of you heard of it, SKA. This is uh, the largest universe casing research. It's based in, in, in South Africa. Ethiopia and Nigeria are now looking up to, to the space as well. So it's not as if nothing happens. Huge and massive things happen in Africa. But the problem is we're all only looking at where the problem is. Yeah. And it's easy to report those, those things. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Look, we, we were all concerned in the panel that, um, uh, you know, did you notice that you've been eating lunch since 12.15, according to the program? <laughs> I've noticed that maybe one is, in China, you have to be eating lunch at 12 o'clock, otherwise you can't be Chinese. But <laughs> we appear to have been undermined by the illicit flows people who, who flowed on, <laughs> <laughs> flowed on and on and on, unfortunately <laughs> with no care uh, to, to, to deal with them. So we, we decided we have to at least ask you guys for 15 minutes of comments and questions so that our panel can uh, react. So can I just ask you to um, uh, indicate if you have a question. Oh, wait a minute. Talk to your next door neighbor for two minutes about what you want to say. Go on. Huh? No, well, you can talk to Kerry. Him. <laughs> no. just two the minutes chair. to your next door talk. neighbor, and then we'll get uh, six questions. Go walk to him. Yeah, so people who can ask one question or make a comment in one sentence, uh, uh, put your hands up those who want to interact. And I'll just give you a number, and we may or may not have time for the panel to react because the panel has already said a lot. We, we start with your number one. Madam, you've already talked to you about. <laughs> number two. Number three. Kenneth, his name is, so I'm giving him number four. Uh, number five, at the back, a lady, six. Oh, I was told not to say this is a lady. Six, then seven. Somebody from UCT, where is that chap? Europe. Okay, seven. And last one, uh, up on the, yes. Okay, so number one first. Who is number one? It's me. Right, on you go. Okay, my question is for uh, Professor Samson. As part of the uh, 2063 African Agenda, is there any plan to have an African level ranking? Is there any plan to have what, an African? An African level ranking for universities. Is it part of the agenda? OK, good question. Uh, who's number two? Yes? Who are you number two? <laughs> you? No, no, wait a uh, who is number two? We'll come back later. Yeah, you are here. My name is uh, Shingirai, I'm from Rhodes uh, University, and I oh think good. I just want to make a comment about this assumption that the production of knowledge when it comes to these rankings is neutral. Um, and I think this is a, pl a place for uh, Mr. Beatty maybe to comment, because it seems to me that your assertions are that it's just data. 
And there's no such thing as just data. All knowledge is produced for a reason. And <laughs> even, even if you, it is scientific and there are numbers, it is produced for a reason, for a particular purpose. And I'm not saying that there's some sort of African conspiracy, but the, the, your... Okay, we get the point, we no, get the yeah, point. Your, 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 the assertion that you make, that it is neutral data, is incorrect. Um, there's no such thing as neutral data. Not that it's produced from somewhere for a reason. I agree with you. Thanks very much from Rhodes University. Um, and the data about how wonderful it is to leave the EU is also not data. <laughs> <laughs> All our friends here from Brussels, Germany, Italy, let's stay in there. You're not meant to do this as chair, but let's stay in. <laughs> okay, who's number three? Number three. Well, just to just say who you are. My name is Zachary, and I'm a student at LSE. And just to add on uh, what she mentioned, especially to do with ranking and uh, the issue of decolonization of the academia, I would be of the view that was presented by Betty, I would take it that the debate is basically about intellectual hegemony and power. So African countries probably should realize that we are operating within an academia that is that, that was established by Europe, and we either play part of it, or we start one which is our own, and it's, that's not feasible. So just like you know, Indonesia and other countries, I've seen that the data that is applied by this ranking system, there are things that work. So it's better for Africa, <coughs> in as much as we want to realize our identity within the academia, we have to just, go to play part of it. Though at this moment, maybe, we might rank down there because of resources and all that, but I'd be really supporting what Phil provides, that's the data, about the papers that have been published, yeah, okay. the research that goes on. So, so that, let's that, take that, that got a very good point. Look at what China did. China, a uh, university in China, not the Chinese government, Chinese University, uh, Shanghai Jiao Chong, said, okay, we're gonna do the same thing. We'll have a ranking. Uh, we'll rank the rest of the world, <laughs> okay? okay? Good for them. And they also have a China ranking, but Zachary, your point is very well taken. Who's number four? Yeah, Kenneth. Yeah, hi, I'm Ken. Um, I'm a former UCT student. Um, I'm now studying in Germany, a master's program. Um, my question is that while university education is very important and we can have this whole debate around ranking them and comparing them. Um, shouldn't the focus be more, particularly in Africa, shouldn't the focus be more on the provision of um, high quality um, junior and secondary education rather than not so much about universities at the moment? No. <laughs> <laughs> Africa has suffered from those proposals for, for two or three decades and don't forget that the proportion of the age group in African universities, S SSA, is only 8%. 8% of the, of the age group, 19 to 24, your age group, uh, that's been generous to some of you, <laughs> are, are in universities. So it's very hard to sell that at the moment, Kenneth. Um, who, is, who is number uh, six or five? Yeah, here, up here. Yeah, you're six, yeah. Yeah. Perfectly okay to call me a lady. I'm not going to take offence. Sorry. Here, here. Um, uh, I want. I wanted to uh, ask a question about the differentiation between humanities and maths and sciences, uh, because the science behind building a bridge is the same science, effectively globally. Maths is, by and large, a global language, as is physics, and therefore there does need to be an element of benchmarking in the mathematics and the sciences in order for universities, such as MIT or Imperial University in, the, uh, in, in, in London to compete against each other in those particular sectors. And I wondered if the panel had any, because uh, I, I take the point about ballerina studies, I, you know, that is a point well made, but in maths and sciences, I think it's a little different. Thank, thank you very much. Who was number seven? Uh, oh yes, over here. Um, hi, I'm Debbie from Cambridge. I have a question that's- From where? Cambridge. Right. That's slightly related to Kenneth's, but I'm wondering with the issue of decolonizing education, I've been making universities higher class. 
So one thing that's been coming up recently from Ghana is what's written in textbooks, right? So you have in primary school textbooks people saying things like some countries are poor because their citizens are lazy, or saying that colonization was good because it stopped people from being barbaric, or that the primary function of your head is for carrying loads. And so I'm wondering, as you are trying to achieve all these things in universities, to what degree do you feel like some of these are rooted in the fact that there are still problems in primary and secondary education before people even get to your universities? And what actions are universities taking to kind of help primary and secondary schools address those, those problems, be it through syllabuses or, or outreach to those schools? What do you think is being done? What could be done better? Th th thanks. Look, who, who feels that they really ought to have a chance to have a question? We'll take two more. Uh, what about my South African friend from UCT? Have, have you asked a question yet? Yes. You have? Okay. Yes. Uh, um, my name is Cinderella from Leeds, Uganda. I have a question for the panel and all of us. Who is researching Africa? Who? Who is researching Africa in all aspects? Mm -hmm. Then the second question, all of you in the panel, how many of you have your books or articles on the shelves of the remotest university in Africa. If I show of hand in a second. <laughs> Me too. Me too. So if you are researching or trying to decolonize or bring the other alternative to the narrative we are trying to challenge, and you're, you're writing, your work is not in any shelf or is not being read by the African student or practitioner, then I think we're not solving the problem. What you're doing in Europe, the brain drain, you, the brain drain, as you claim, that you brought here, if it's not being used back at home, then you're not solving the problem. My, my, old, my old university in Nairobi used to make it mandatory if, if you got research permission to do research in Kenya, you had to leave your thesis or your consultancy report or your book in the, in the university and in the national archives. And you know, that ought to be policed very seriously because otherwise people come in, they get the data, and they leave. And so it's a, it's a very good point. Thank you for making it. Our last comment is from here, the lady in blue. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name's Aurelua, no longer a student, but I studied at the LSE as well, um, social no policy development. <laughs> Um, so my question goes back to one of the questions that was part of the discussion earlier around the marginalization of African research in um, the global context, so in terms of publications and journals. And the question I'd like to put to the panel is whether or not we need, there's uh, a need for perhaps some introspection in terms of the way Africans view their own research and value the work that is being done on the continent. Who are we writing for? So it, it ties in with the, you know, the previous question. Who is this research being done for? Who is our target audience? Because right. I don't think that when articles written about Africa in international journals by researchers from the West, I don't think the target audience is Africa. I don't think they have us in mind when they're doing a lot of the research. Who do we have in mind when we're doing the research? And does that in itself then have an implication on you know, how the work is being received and how it's being dispersed? Okay, thank you very much. We, we, are, we have been uh, commanded by the organizers <coughs> to begin eating lunch at one o'clock, which is in three minutes. So we're going to rank the panel on the following parts. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they have to select from those eight or nine questions something that they can answer in two sentences. And they, I will cut them off after two sentences. So let's, get a, let's see who does that best. It's a, it's a tricky job. Uh, and we will start with Phil. In terms of the Africa ranking, um, I think very importantly, when we go to Africa, we are invited by African universities and they host our events. Next week, I'm in Ghana, invited by the University of Ghana, and I'll be setting up an advisory group made up entirely of African university leaders on a future African ranking, how we adapt and change, and develop the methodology we have, the data we have, and apply it to an African context. But that's not to say I don't think African universities should very strongly be engaged in the global rankings as well. Uh, that's three sentences, but pretty well done. Um, <laughs> so, Beatrice, with your uh, University of Athens training, I have high hopes. 
um, issues of quality, relevance in the whole education system have confronted uh, policy makers for a long time. And now there are systems of accountability. Um, of course, the management is resisting this. For example, they want to go into um, performance contracting whereby you are accountable for some kind of, uh, to some kind of criteria um, to what you're doing in terms of reviewing the curriculum, in terms of using relevant examples, etc., etc. It is a struggle, but we will get there. That's up to five, not bad. Uh, down to you with your training in... Excuse me, thanks. Uh, with researching Africa and whether we are actually contributing towards that, that's a very important question, yeah. instead of simply lamenting what is happening elsewhere. Yes, at least as far as I'm concerned, we've got at least 10 books. Uh, I will make sure that when I negotiate with the funders, whoever that funder may be, I will make sure that those books are available in the, at least in the flagship universities in all 54 countries. Thank you uh, very much, thank you. And, and uh, the, last, the last word is with Indri. Well, um, <laughs> Kodesria, the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, whose uh, former executive director is here, uh, Tandika, we often encounter a crisis of legitimacy because there's a lot of work that is produced. But as a member of the scientific committee for years, when we were reviewing uh, abstracts for the conference, conferences, we saw that many more Europeans were cited on the same topic than the African producing very relevant work in Africa. So our education system needs to be um, in tune with what we want to produce. There are issues, uh, as a, also a member of the Association of African Women for Research and Development, how do, do issues regarding gender, representation, inclusion, and the education and the production of knowledge, relevant knowledge from our own history and perspectives and vision. All this needs to be, no, that was one sentence. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm from the wrong, we were all colonized. Sadly, I was colonized by the French. So they have a tendency of doing long sentences. <laughs> Look, I would like, I would like you to, you know, the, 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 there's a new ranking, the LSE ranking, of, uh, of panels in Africa summits. This, this ranking has, uh, would claim that they're all class A, uh, they, they all get their lunch. And can I suggest that those of you who ask them questions and who want to interrogate further our panel, that you get your lunch and go to the tables over on the left here outside. We'll all go on that side. So if you want to meet with us and engage further with us, whether you ask a question or not, do go to the left-hand side. Can I ask you now to thank our panel for <laughs>